So the reason we actually brought David Sampson on is to explain this massive story in the world of sports media, sports business, and gambling. And while I was contemplating how to phrase a tricky question for me as a part-time ESPN employee, I noticed that there is a cooing in the shipping container because Jess brought her dog in and it made me think of how much David Sampson is terrified of Jess's it's dog. It's one of my favorite moments in the history of this show, <laughs> seeing David's reaction to Willow. Willow, that's the name of the dog. <laughs> I'd still rather be in studio than on Zoom. So, David, when you saw the headline here that Dave Portnoy, the founder of Barstool Sports, this cult figure in the world of sports media, has actually gotten 100% of Barstool back. They had sold Barstool to Penn Gaming in some financial arrangement to make Barstool Sportsbook a thing. I think he sold it for a half billion dollars, got it back for nothing. For zero oh, yes. dollars, yeah. reportedly. And so, it's David, exactly right. explain this headline because that part, let alone the ESPN bet rebranding of Penn Gaming, is one of those things that I don't know what to trust. So it's two totally different stories, and I'm happy to start with the Barstool part, but make sure that we do the ESPN part correctly. Barstool and Penn, they basically, Penn bought Barstool. Dave Port and I used to run it. Penn bought it. It was a step transaction, and they valued the company at a ridiculous number. They then bought all of the company, paid off Portnoy. However, they were then in charge. But the real money is in gambling, and the real money is in betting. And so Barstool had an app. It was a betting app, and Penn was using that with, in 16 different states, except it didn't get any market share. It wasn't going anywhere. And Penn Gaming said, we can do better than this. All we have is Surus with Dave Portner. We have to worry about everything the guy says. We're worried about our gambling licenses all the time, and we can't stand it anymore. We want to get rid of them. Who's the best brand that we can associate with in sports? ESPN. They knock on ESPN's door and they say, hey, you guys need some cash, don't you? You're under financial pressure. Disney stock price under pressure. We'll give you $150 million a year if we can use your four letters. And ESPN said, wait, you'll give us $150 million every year for 10 years, plus the opportunity to buy stock in your company. And all we have to do is change the name of Barstool app, the betting app to ESPN bet. You've got yourself a deal. It's a dream for Jimmy Pitaro. The president of ESPN gets to bring cash on the books and he gets to say to his customers, you watch ESPN, we talk about the games, now you can bet on the games while we're talking about the games. We are a full service operation and we will get the DraftKings and FanDuel duopoly, we'll get on the podium and we'll get rid of all the competition. So, so that's one side of the deal. The barstool side though, David, right? Mm -hmm. I wanna frame this in a very simple way for the audience to understand. Was this a win or a loss for Dave Portnoy? It's a huge win because he no longer answers to anyone. He was always his own boss. He could hire who he wanted, Ben Mintz. He could say what he wanted with reckless indifference toward licenses, toward regulation, toward a boss of any kind. The ultimate pirate ship guy went corporate and realized he was miserable and found a way out. And all he had to give up was future sales what does that mean a kicker if he ever sells barstool because he now owns 100 percent of it again if he sells it to anyone pen gets 50 percent so it's not like portnoy right. owns 100 percent of the entity he owns 100 percent of the annual profits or the annual losses but if he monetizes barstool 50 percent of it still goes to pen under this deal is in perpetuity so so it has not been reported how long this lasts because what Portnoy said is, I will never sell. Well, never say never, number one. Number two, your estate is gonna have something to say about that once you croak. So whether or not this continues on after his death, we do not know. This interest that Penn has in Barstool. Next, Barstool can't do its own gambling app. ESPN bet is with Penn. Barstool on its own cannot compete with them, ever. We don't so know they're how out of sports gambling for the length out. of this agreement. Which isn't insignificant, by the way, because there's a lot of money in that. So they now would need to find a new way to 
generate all of that revenue that they would get from gambling companies. Well, yes, but Barstool, their app with Penn, it didn't really do well. They didn't have a big market share at all. It was not driving business the way that Penn thought it should and could. So Penn ends up upgrading with ESPN and Portnoy gets out of the gambling business when people are trying to get into it because he was so interested in keeping his voice. So he's stepping over dollars to pick up free nickels. And the free is his ability to talk. The nickels are the fact that he was willing to give up future potential money. The fact that he was willing to not do business in the sports book world, in the ad revenue world for a period of time. All sorts of covenants is what you're reading. That means promises made by Portnoy that he will not do because he got the company back from Penn. Is it a trade worth doing? For both sides, it's a win-win. David, do you think the combination of ESPN and Penn will be able to do what you suggested earlier, knock out all the other competition? Because FanDuel and DraftKings has a huge head start. Right. So I didn't say they'd knock them out. To me, it's it's getting on the podium, right? Right now, it's right. DraftKings and FanDuel, and there's no one else close. Fox just went out of business. Barstool had a tiny share. Caesars, BetMGM, they're all, they're all nothing compared to what DraftKings and FanDuel have done. The, what they're betting, what ESPN is betting, pun intended, is that they can be in the same stratosphere as DraftKings and FanDuel. Are they going to replace them? No way. But it is why you're seeing DraftKings with the network and why FanDuel wanted a network and why they're trying to be all things to people. Because when you have audience, imagine, Stu, your audience, people watching your show, they can watch it on the network while the app is open. They can bet on Thursday Thunder, as an example, all at the same time. And that's what will happen with ESPN Bet. And that's what DraftKings wants to do, is doing, and will continue to do better as its distribution grows. But you're looking now at three different companies who are competing for the betting dollar, and there's a lot of betting dollars out there. David, what kind of regulation exists with regards to ESPN being a news-breaking outfit and also having its own gambling operation? So you guys were, were doing your show, but on Nothing Personal this morning, uh, which is a, a podcast that I do with Metal Arc, it is a... Big topic for me, the conflict of interest mm -hmm. with what happened as an example with Shams and the draft. I mean, mm -hmm. what Shams was able to do when he tweeted out that there was going to be a different draft order and all of a sudden the line moved and Shams has a deal where he also gets paid by FanDuel. Is there a conflict there? ESPN is going to be very careful because they do not want any sort of regulation. They don't want Washington interrupting any of what they're doing at all. But... When you're watching a pregame show and they are, the insiders are giving you information about a game, are you going to act on that information when it comes to placing a bet on ESPN bet? ESPN is hoping you do, but they're not gonna talk about it. They're gonna talk about the ethical wall that they're gonna build between inside information and the outgoing source of information about betting. They'll call it the ethical wall. Guess what? That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. People have information and the smart bettors are going to know who to listen to when and try to take advantage of that. So the ethical wall you're describing is a tricky one, of course. It's also a version that has existed when it comes to rights deals and the journalists that are employed by the companies that pay for those rights. So this is a tricky dance that has happened throughout the decades. The different spin here seems to be that there is actually, because of the nature of sports betting, a more direct public relationship between news you're breaking and the ability for people to act on that, David. It's, it's a familiar problem. problem. It's a familiar problem, though, is my point at the same time. Right. I, I actually would, would distinguish the problems. What you're talking about is when, when owners watch MLB Network and get annoyed when MLB Network says something bad about their team and they call up the commissioner and say, I want that person off the air. Or when the owner of a baseball team listens to what the announcer's saying yes. and suspends him like Kevin Brown or fires him like John Miller, mm. like the Orioles have done and that I've done as well. It is that there's no money there. That's ego. And that is, we don't want anything negative being spoken. What we're talking about within the gambling world, we're talking dollars and cents versus emotions and feelings. That's fair. Although I would imagine that in the minds of yourself and your colleagues, 
when you were making those calls, there was ego with also a concern of protecting a brand, right? Like when you're complaining, give me an example, David Sampson, of you making a call to complain about something that you felt was entirely ego and not financial. When we would be criticized for uh, a player move that we did, sending out a player, and the, the broadcaster would say, well, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Like Yuri Perez right now with the Marlins when he was sent down. Bad move. There was a lot of criticism, but she didn't get it from the announcers. Gabby Sanchez was not going after the Marlins for Yuri Perez being sent down. Why? He'd get in trouble. He's got a backup management. And anytime an announcer would do something, Tommy Hutton used to do it all the time. He was very critical of us, and it bothered Jeffrey Laurie, the owner, very, very much, very much. We'd have to go into the booth during games, and sometimes we'd lie to Jeffrey and say we did it because he wasn't there, and sometimes we'd actually do it if we thought it was egregious. It's sort of like the prayers in the wall. We would look to see what the issue was, and we'd be the ones to decide whether we would we would answer Jeffrey's prayer or a question, but that's a real thing. But again, Pablo, no money. That was... That was not even a brand issue. That is just, hey, you're not being nice to me, and I want you to be. David, we have a minute left, and I heard Stu Gatz FaceTiming, FaceTiming someone. someone? What's I'm happening? Like... What was that? I didn't mean to. I hit the button by mistake. Sorry. Joe Theismann again? We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't Joe T. <laughs> David, r really quick, I don't know if you already talked about this, but Kevin Brown, what happened to him with the Orioles? That's I mean, backfired, right? That, I mean, like, it's that like, has to be – that. that's got to come from – up the, from the owner's box, right? There's no one working professional who would, who would do that, would they? It's only from the owner's box. And the Angeloses are famous, Peter, and then he passed that on to his sons. Uh, they put the thin in thin-skinned, and uh, this did backfire. And what I'd said on uh, Nothing Personal is that if there's more to the story, the Orioles would have leaked it. <laughs> if it wasn't just what he said about the Rays and the Orioles, which is the clip we've all seen, if there's more to the story... Once the negative press started happening and the avalanche began, they needed to leak what he actually did. Even if it's private, no matter what it was, they had to leak it. And no leaks have come out, which means all Kevin Brown did was do exactly what he should do. And that's why the Orioles are and got in so much trouble. David Sampson, the podcast is nothing personal. It is excellent. It is an unusual look at the inside of a boardroom where usually we don't get allowed. So thank you, David. You're not going to ask him about the Angels? You've been trying to talk about the Angels for two days here. Two goddamn days. David, 30 seconds or less. How bad are the Angels for not trading Shohei Otani? I don't blame them. Who would want to be the guy to trade a future Hall of Famer and get Bupkis back? You'd have to be an idiot. Can people Bupkis. stop saying <laughs> Bupkis? <laughs> Why is everyone saying Bupkis? That's a good joke by David. Good joke. <laughs> Goodbye, David. So David Sampson is already laughing for reasons that are confusing to me. <laughs> David, hello. Hello. What's going on with you? I'm laughing because I haven't been able to speak to Stu for, off the air at all, only on the air since I got back from Israel. <laughs> and Stu and I had a moment while I was there, and I was reminded of it, and now I'm back on the air with him, so I still haven't been able to talk through it with him, so I'm just going to have to do it on the air. Uh, what'd you do for me? I mean, I know the discussion we had uh, when you went to Israel. Uh, I know what I asked you to do. I was not confident that you would actually do it. So why don't you kind of take the audience through that? So when you go to Israel, in theory, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, you visit the Western Wall, which is a prayer wall in Jerusalem, the <laughs> holiest city for just about every religion there is. And, and Stu and I share religion. So he said to me, hey, while you're there, would you mind putting in a good word for the Jets? <laughs> no. And I said, Not for my kids, my family, or anyone else, just the Jets. Yep. It blew my mind. Because from my standpoint, what that wall is for is you say a prayer for health. And with all the things that have gone on in my family, in, in Dan's family, in everybody's family, there's a reason, there's a need for health. So I thought Stu was gonna come up with something because he wasn't beat Stu Gotts. This was off the air. So I thought that he was gonna say something meaningful and important. <laughs> and instead he said to me, please put in a prayer for the Jets. Well, for, did you? For Aaron Rodgers' health. Yes. I mean, have you seen all the injuries they've suffered over the last seven years? I said to him, 
I don't know whether I can do it because we're asking the wall or God or whoever you pray to, Aaron to Rogers. in the same breath, care about Aaron Rodgers' health and the Jets and care about someone who you love being sick. I don't know that I can do it, but then I got there and <laughs> I hadn't spoken to him. I'd been gone for a week or so. And all of a sudden I take the piece of paper, I take the pen and I take video and here it is. Aaron Rodgers leads the Jets to a Super Bowl victory. And I have video yes. of me putting the paper in the wall of the Western Wall, and God is going to strike me down right freaking now. You, you, do you guys have God, like, opening, like, unfurling it, like, okay, cure Nana from her uh, really bad arthritis. We'll get to okay. that. Yep. Yeah, he, right. He's in an office and with, like, then, one of those pneumatic tubes that get shot yeah. up into it. It's like, Jets win the it's Super like Bowl. Bruce yeah. <laughs> like, uh, like uh, the, or do you have God like finally someone's not asking me for some someone to get healed or money? Jets or win a Super Bowl? This is easy. <laughs> yeah. I'm so tired of all these sick people. Yeah. I'm gonna and, intervene with the NFL this year. And then when he's when he's done, does God like ball it up in their shoe like Kobe, like into the trash can? Looks like Kobe points at him. <laughs> it's even worse than that because there's so many pieces of paper inside the wall, and I'm shorter than the average person. So I was trying to find a place very low and I couldn't get very high. You can see where the tall people pray because they can get the piece of paper in a place they don't give you ladders and you can't really jump because you'll break your head open. So I had to put my prayers in a, in a place. And then all I could picture being cynical is every night there must be a guy yep. who comes and takes out every paper and then just throws it away because there's no way <laughs> there's decades of people coming to this wall putting paper in there and like it still hasn't filled up somehow there has yeah, to it's be a big wall i mean <laughs> <laughs> it's not as big as you think it's like a tv studio you think it's really big until you get there and then you say wow this is not as big as i would have expected but that said there was no 30 year old paper in there and i've been to israel many times clearly somebody's job is to get rid of the paper. Well, not get rid and of them. What do they do with it? Wait, not so you guys them. have like a cleaning crew coming through every single night, not checking out the prayers, what people are asking for, and whatever they deem meaningful stays and what they don't gets thrown away? So you guys ever been to a driving range? You know the, the kid that no. drives that car? No, that, he hasn't. <laughs> that, that collects all the balls and stuff? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it just, yes. You always try to those. hit that thing. That's yes. what you always try to hit. You got one of those. Like the big it, tractor with a rake behind it. Yeah, yeah. But, but it just takes all the paper out. And then what they do is they take all those papers and they just FedEx them to God. It just lands. He's got, there. this is, Lord, uh, this is uh, August uh, the 8th right here. Just stacked up. He's got an in and an out thing on his desk. Right. And the out is never full. And the in is just a like mountain high. Paper, it never stops. <laughs> Can you imagine the guy whose job it is to decide which prayers are wall worthy and which are not? Oh, and there's some that get left in. All of them, and he sees Aaron Rodgers leading the Jets. Let's list. hope that guy is a Jet fan. I mean, <laughs> David. That's why I was laughing. Pablo. Thank you for doing it. I appreciate you doing that. A uh, a very tanned David Sampson is joining us, and your tan David has been an object of fascination in a group chat I was on with. Chris and Stugatz about whether we wanted you on the show today. And Chris wanted you on the show today not to talk about God and prayers, but because he noticed that you're, uh, what'd you call it, Chris? His farmer's tan on his feet. Let's pull this up. So uh, this oh. is a full day of sandals. Can we zoom in? I, I want the, no. yeah. Oh, geez. Lucy is horrified. Come on. What's going on here, David? How many straight hours in the sun are we with, with flip-flops for this kind of tan line? I only wear flip-flops when I'm outside. If I'm not running in running shoes, other than that, I'm only in flip-flops. <laughs> so for weeks, at a t whenever I do anything outside, it's just with flip-flops. That seems like a but poor choice. Why would you not crop the photo? <laughs> <laughs> like, why would you not just cut it out a little bit? I, I, I'm a one-and-done guy. So that was the photo that was taken. I was actually trying to promote the Nothing Personal merchandise and to talk about sort of the past, the present, and the future. And my feet are just my feet. They were in the shot. One and done is also um, your ranking on Wiki Feet. <laughs> Give it to him. His feet are fine. Oh, okay. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Would you be shocked to know there's a backstory to that tan line? <laughs> or like a foot story. <laughs> 
Hey, oh. Not as funny. <laughs> but, yeah, let's hear it. You gave it to yourself, really? Uh, I, You'd be I ashamed approve. of yourself. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's a backstory beyond the fact that you wear a thong sounds like sandals. You, sounds like you wear sandals and the sun was out and you got a tan. Yeah, End of so story. story ah, is, I, I can't see. Part of the problem with Zoom is I actually can't see where the clock is or what we're doing, and I forgot you to got keep plen- track. You got plenty time. of time. You got plenty of time. We're not on air. So, Don't worry about it. The quick backstory is that I was whitewater rafting in, in 1998 during the home run chase in the Grand Canyon, and I was not in baseball. I was working on Wall Street at the time, and you have to wear these sandals that you buy that are strapped like Birkenstock sandals. They have a strap over two parts. And I, for the first time in my life, I got a foot tan where there were marks on my feet after that trip. And that trip was one of the most meaningful trips of my life. To this day, it's one of the most meaningful trips of my life. And I was 30 years old and I looked down and I said, I never want to forget that moment and how I felt in the canyon. And so from that day forward, I have had uh, foot tan lines. I feel like Billy's version of the backstory was a little better. If I like a place, I go, I get a magnet or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't change my lifestyle forever. And I've stuck with it. I've stuck with it for all these years, for 25 years, that I continue. And every time I look at my feet, I'm back in the canyon. I once tried to go to the Grand Canyon. I was covering spring training in Arizona for Sports Illustrated. Drove at about like 2 p.m. out of Mesa, watched the Cubs, went with a friend to the Grand Canyon, got there. It was. Look at me, the wind. Got there and it was dark. Oh, yeah. No, I thought you were going to say cold because. I mean, it was cold. I was wearing shorts and I mean, that's sandals. That's the thing. It's like you go to spring freezing. training, it's like 85 degrees, and everything's great. You're like, let's go to Grand Canyon. And you drive up there. When you get up there and you get up to the rim, it is frigid because you realize oh arizona's not hot southern arizona's hot it was frigid and also um unlit and yeah. i drove back having seen nothing there are no floodlights there are no i i i, I really did you not don't go there at night that. dude <laughs> yeah that wasn't How my plan you planned it so badly pablo how's that possible <laughs> even for you to have left at a time that your arrival would have been in the dark we were racing the sun and i lost they don't teach You're- clocks at harvard Let's not make this about me, guys. <laughs> Pablo Torre finds out how time works after the break. <laughs> Pablo, did, did, does anyone from Harvard ever contact you and say, like, can you stop? Just, like, stop what it is that you do? Yeah, just, like, I kind of feel like, you know, Harvard, they've got someone at Harvard there who's monitoring all the alums, what they're up to, what diseases they're curing what this person just invented this yeah Uh, supreme court over here pablo torre finds out the harvard alumni association hates him (laughs) after the break pablo.show are you a disappointment to everyone who went to harvard are you uh probably yeah i mean there is a kid who's running for president who i went to school with this guy vivek ramaswamy oh yeah he used to sit in justice we i took a justice class it's moral reasoning 22 i think and it was a big lecture hall in like a Harry Potter sort of auditorium. And I only knew Vivek Ramaswamy, presidential candidate, uh, I believe polling third, right behind Ron DeSantis, mm-hmm. because he would raise his hand in lecture in the shape of a V. Ew. What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, look, I've read a lot about this guy, and that by far is the most alarming. Also, which says a lot. he went to our reunion. He went to our... 15-year reunion, brought a black SUV that he just kept parked outside with the driver waiting in it and would, like, bring the food out of the reunion and eat it in his SUV and, like, have, like, private get-togethers in this car. This is not someone that we should elect for any office. That's not the- for various reasons. <laughs> At the beginning when you said you knew a kid that was running for president, I thought it was an actual kid that went to Harvard with you. Like, you know, you like have a, to be this kid, right? Like, like a, like like a Jonathan <laughs> Lipnicki character. Yeah, like, Doogie yeah, I know this kid. He's running for president. I'm like, oh damn. The human head weighs eight pounds. This is gonna get aggregated to like the hill now. I think I just accidentally broke some you political did, yeah. gossip. Oh god. Well, not accidentally. You had a choice. How long have you been waiting to bring that up since you saw that he was polling? Months. How awful does the inside of that car smell? Poor driver. They're just bringing food in there and. 
crumbs everywhere. You got the, like the drivers do it just fine. No. Guy smells like tuna fish now. Where's David? I'm looking at the clock. I'm great. <laughs> I'm thinking about the fact that it's Yale v. Harvard in the presidential race, and then it's Trump on the Republican side. To give you a sense of how the sausage is made, how the sausage fingers are made here, in between segments, I asked Chris Cody about this topic that was on our rundown for the show, the Sesta Cyclones, the High Lie team that you own, had a draft, and I said, Chris, it's a, it's a topic. What do you got? And you said, it happened. Look, it was on the topic yesterday, it. more as like a preview of the draft. Now we're reviewing it. Look, we brought the old band back together. Uh, last year was a terrible season for the Sesta Cyclones. So why did you bring them back so together? Back. Because two years ago, I mean, geez, let me get to it, guys. Two years ago, we won a title <laughs> with our core, and last year, the fourth, fifth, and round pick, we, we we had a lower pick, so we didn't get the guys we wanted. This year, because of last year's bad season, we were able to get the guys we wanted low, later in the draft, and we had the decision. Uh, we were being pressured by a lot of people, thinking that we should not go with our Manu who we've had for three seasons, but we, you know, Douglas, young, younger, more athletic guy, but we went with Old Faithful. We didn't think the top of our roster was the problem last year. Um, so we're, we're feeling good about the team. That's not what's happening here. What's happening? There's a new billionaire on the block who's entered the league. Mm -hmm. A couple. Who's the other one? So Masvidal is now an oh. owner in their league. UD is now UD an owner in their league. Both in attendance last night. Man, we were the cool... Owners for a couple seasons. Right, you guys are done. Last, like, last night, like in previous years, like early in the draft, some lady would come up to me, hey, can we interview you for the mm -hmm. their little Wait, like, wanna, highlight I network? I want to put this on the poll. Juju, put on the poll, please. Is Chris Cody still a cool highlight nope. owner? I'm telling you, last Not night, list, I, didn't, I got interviewed, but it was like at the very end. They were just like, and I, was, I literally called the lady out. I was just like, it's fine. Last year, you got to me a little sooner. This year, Masvidal and UD, I get it. <laughs> it's fine. Leaking confidence, man. Like, But I get it, man. It's it's like in you know in English Premier League soccer it was like these community owned clubs and everyone's like feels a part of it and then these Russian billionaires come in and are like I've got this and next thing you know teams that were trash overnight were just powerhouses changing the landscape of European football forever and that's what's happening in High Life. I will start a little beef here though because last night I heard a lot with from UD. Talk because like he was at the table right next to us. So Chris, almost, be careful. Almost any time he would draft somebody, championship expectations would be his like greeting. Yeah. And uh, UD, <laughs> as someone who's been in the league a couple years, that roster's not winning no championship. Like, whoa! whoa! Your roster. Frankie is not gonna <laughs> defend us from yeah. UD. That, that, I'm just I, saying, I, UD. I don't think we have I get enough it. security. You come in with the first year, you're excited. You're gonna you want to bring that heat culture. I get it. I'm not disrespecting it. I'm sure he is going to change the culture. With the Robote Renegades, but not with the roster he put together. Isn't Monica Puig, the Olympian, also a team owner yes, now? Yes, Monica Puig. Is, is, is Masvidal going to, like, insurrect whoever wins the championship? <laughs> I, I don't know, Yo, Pablo. It, no, it's, but, like, that's got, <laughs> so are you like the He's got to go see him, Pablo. Yeah. Like, what are yeah. you doing? Why did Sorry, you, Udonis Haslam can Why be did you taunted, put Chris Cody Jorge in that Masvidal spot? I know, but you just— fun of her overthrowing the government. What would you want Chris to do with that? I've got I've got UD and the Masvidal like well. in a wrestling ring, throwing Chris against the, the ropes. <laughs> in the, they the play highlight with Chris Cody. They put him in in the what's it called Sesta? Uh, well, the Sesta. I thought you meant the court. Yeah. No. Okay. What, like the, 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 the. It's a Sesta. Yeah. yeah. They put him in. And they fling him against the wall, yep, yeah. and then they catch him, and then they fling him against the wall. So how many new players are on your team? Because it sounds like you drafted largely the same team we, that finished we in had, last place. We have six players on our team. The first, our top three guys, same guys from last year. Same core. Bottom three, totally different. We brought back Jedin and Ikeda, who were on our team when we won the championship. So we have five of the six guys from our championship team. Back to team. your roots. Back to our roots. Yes. And we improved that sixth spot. We had Joseph before. Now we have Bueno. Ripe for great nicknames. Yeah, bueno. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> there was not no bueno last night. It was si bueno. What? We're working on it. We're workshopping yeah. <laughs> on the phrases. I, I, do, I am fascinated with yeah, the idea that, that UD would greet everyone with championship expectations. And now it makes me think, is that what they say at the Heat? Like when you get traded to the Heat? Or you say, like when Damian Lillard gets sent here, is he going to walk in and – are they all going to shake his hands? This is a culture. This is like UD, the Robote Renegade. Sorry. I mean, that culture needs some remodeling. What are you doing? Okay. I, I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying day. that. Dude, 
You with, fi- not only finished in last place, I went to a highlight game last Johnny year. Johnny know nothing over here. Yeah, I, mean, I went to a highlight game last year, and the Sesta Cyclones were playing, and it was late in the season, and there were zero people from the show there. Well, I mean, the that's... team that is proud, you abandoned your team. You yeah. stopped going at the end of Did the year. Did you see our record at that time? You know, that's how it's going to go. You're the owner. If you don't perform, you think... <laughs> You think, you, think, you think Mark Cuban's showing up when they're 10 and 58? Yes. 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 Every yeah. game. not. So really. you're lashing out at their poor performance by not showing up and supporting them. Zagaki. The team you chose. Play better. I love you. Play better. <laughs> Billy, my favorite part about him telling you D to get his in order and all that stuff, is he is basically the Washington Commanders. And you deal here's Eric Bieniemy, and like, they're like, oh, look at this guy t- talking all this stuff. Like, what has he ever done? The rough roster, man. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's hard out here with a rough roster. So as Chris Cody navigates the changing landscape of high lie, I want to turn to what, in fact, is happening in the changing landscape of college football. Lucy, I've been monitoring you all show, and I can just see you grinding your teeth all day about the ACC. I love college football so much because it's stupid, but it has reached a point where it's too stupid. It is too (laughs) dumb. These conferences are so dumb. Right now, we're, like, waiting to see if the ACC officially goes after Stanford and Cal. Nothing says ACC yeah. like Cal. And, and, and S- Stanford and UNC. SMU. <laughs> yeah. SMU also somehow has hitched their wagon to this, too. Uh, SMU, SMU and Virginia. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> SMU was like, you don't have to pay us for five years if you'll, like, take us. And the ACC is like, great. Nothing says Atlantic Coast. Like Palo Alto, Berkeley, and Dallas. It's it's too dumb. At first, it was funny. Like when USC and UCLA went to the Big Ten, This that was quirky. That was weird. Now it's stupid. It's too dumb. These conferences need name changes. Yes. When are we going to – this is my big question. One big what I want to find out is when are these names going to change? <laughs> the big one. It's, it's, I'm like the big one big conference. I'm waiting for that. Like, they're all just going to join the, the same one. Company. I like that. The yeah. big one title game? Jeez. <laughs> Instead I like... of the I, they have just one, so it's B1G. Uh, well, they already did that for yeah. the Big Ten. Yeah, 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 but they can steal it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that we're now coming around to Chip Kelly praising Notre Dame for being independent and saying oh, that all college go. football teams should just be – uh, separate than their Olympic sports, and the Olympic sports can be in the conference that is generally regionally based, but then football should break away. Muffet McGraw is calling for it as well. I feel like we're going to see all of the big time uh, leaders in the Olympic sports, quote unquote, in the quote unquote non revenue generating sports now be like, all right. W- we need a say in this because this is ridiculous. No, absolutely. Like uh, I talked to Jim Beheim about this. I talked to Bob Huggins about this. Like they're Look at me, yeah. Huggy Bear. They're pissed. I was. I went. Doesn't to, really have a say anymore. I went to. Yeah, I went to West Virginia. Like I want to say the year after they went to the Final Four, and it was the day they found out that they were leaving the uh, Big East for Big Twelve. Big Twelve, yeah. 12. and. That staff, I've never seen a, a like a staff more pissed about because they were like, Big East, we go to New York for the tournament. Like you spend like a week in New York, you play at the Garden, all this stuff. Now we have to go to Kansas City. They were irate, but like everyone's saying, like football's doing this to us. Football is ruining everything, ruining these conferences, ruining these rivalries. And so I like I agree with Chip Kelly, like. W- Separate this stuff. Make your regular sports play in a regular conference so that we can have the ACC basketball back, Big East basketball, the Pac-10, and all. Like, let's bring it back to the Football should be the only one that goes through these Yeah, like, if you go play in the conference. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I do like that Notre Dame, as all of the great unbundling and rebundling of college sports is happening, is basically just running a Patreon. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> like you want our football yeah. games? Pay us directly. <laughs> Subscribe. Yeah. Well, Peacock, or right? www.pablo.show. NBC. There is one game on Peacock a year now, which I have, in the past, said I'm glad that my grandparents are deceased for not having to explain the That's login it. situation to them. So yes, but I mean, I think it's incredibly silly, especially for this ACC uh, edition, right, Lucy? Because they're not going to be making that much more money and any money that they'll get from like reopening the ESPN deal and adding these teams sounds like it's going to just be offset by the travel costs because obviously traveling from the Bay Area to Miami or the Bay Area to Virginia or 
Dallas to wherever Pittsburgh. That's actually not that long of a flight, but that, it's ridiculous. Like it's not going to end up making anyone that much more money. And in the meantime, there's rumors that I mean, Florida State people have explicitly been like, we want to get out of the ACC, but they're so locked into this TV contract that it's going to cost them tons of money to leave and potentially be not worth leaving because of how long the contract is for. So no one has actually decided they're going to do it yet. So it just makes very little sense and seems like something that the ACC is doing as a way to like try to stay relevant yeah like the Big 12 did but then the Big 12 signed the TV deal that kind of made them feel solid and the ACC can't really do that I'm curious to see if the like Stanford Cal joining this conference reopens that TV deal in a way that Florida State Clemson Miami UNC now have an avenue to leave that's the Mm. risk you take with that and also a thing with travel costs is these small sports are not getting the revenue like it's going to be harder for them to fly all of their players out across the country it's there are effects just across the board and they're all bad it's very silly and I do wonder if the argument to break away college football from the universities and the conference structure does it's a non-starter because of the lingering question of whether or not these athletes will be classified as employees because how can you make that argument that they aren't if you then create their own little separate ecosystem for them to play and for the universities to make the most amount of money off of them versus the quote-unquote non-revenue generating sports (laughs) sorry about that (laughs) pardon me (laughs) i just like how the person who is most responsible for the chaos (laughs) of the acc the tummy ache in this conference Happens to be the guy that we all work for. Yeah, he screwed them. But John everything... Skipper screwed the ACC. I, we can always I do apologize for doing that to your program. He does a great. <laughs> it <skip>. really <laughs> is the best, Mr. Uh, Lebetard. <laughs> Dan Lebetard. <laughs>